and welcome everyone to my talk about the future of accelerator programming in C++. Um, just a little disclaimer before I start. I don't want to present the future of uh, accelerator programming in C++ today here. I want to present the current state that we have, what we can do today, and what I would like the future um, for, C for accelerator programming in C++ to look like. Um, just one slide about myself. Um, I have been developing C++ libraries for um, strange architectures for a while. I started with the cell processor, which is uh, the fault of Joel Falcou. Um, I don't know if you know this processor, it's dead, um, pretty much dead today, but it's, it was quite an interesting um, processor. And yeah, this kind of got me started uh, in working uh, with interesting architectures and um, I, and working um, on making this architectures accessible to um, everyday programmers. Uh, today I work in a medical imaging research institute. We do MRI imaging. Um, we try to improve the method of MRI by uh, mathematical and physical um, new uh, tricks and tec uh, new technology. Um, one key element uh, in our research is not acquiring MRI images, but MRI movies. I just brought uh, an example here. This is an MRI Im a movie of the thorax of a human. I will just start the movie. You can see the beating heart, the breathing. Um, this, Im this video is the result of a very complex um, algorithm that doesn't work without GPU acceleration. For this technology to be useful for clinics, um, we have to have the results of this, of an MRI uh, acquisition very fast. We cannot uh, ask the clinicians to, to wait for an hour for the results, so we need um, some means of getting the results very fast, and the best thing we could find is for this is GPUs. Um, so I'm developing and maintaining sort of a multi-GPU signal processing program, which is uh, basically the program that produces the images or videos like this. Um, but I'm also supporting scientists that prototype signal processing um, algorithms like this. They try to improve these algorithms, um, and I try to help them use GPUs or other um, fast architectures to have their algorithms run fast. Um, because I found that if you give scientists a tool to run for, for them to run their algorithms more efficiently, like if you, usually they run their algorithms in 10 hours, if I help them to run their algorithms in 10 minutes, they will start to ask very different questions and this will improve their science and their scientific results. So I really like this, this kind of work because you see instant improvement there. Um, I, we also try to do a large-scale simulation of this kind of image acquisition where we combine the simulation of an MRI experiment with um, computational fluid dynamics. Um, and this is also a very good fit for GPUs, so I'm, I'm also working on this. Um, who here in the room has ever programmed an accelerator? Okay, a few. For fun, yeah. Um, so this is why my one slide that introduces uh, accelerator programming. It's very rough, but I hope it conveys the basic idea. So let's assume you have a vector, a two-dimensional vector here. Each block is one element of the vector. And if you wanted to scale this vector by some value, you could, you probably wouldn't, but you could write for a CPU program something like this. You would iterate over the whole vector and scale each element separately by a value. Very simple. Um, of course, some might now uh, say, okay, this is, not, this is not how we would do it. We would probably use SIMD. We would work on multiple elements at the same time. We would maybe even use multiple threads. But basically, on the CPU, you work only on a few elements at a time. Very different for the GPU or for the accelerator, where you have so many ar arithmetic logic units in, in the device that you can literally work on each element at the same time. And this is also expressed in the way how, you, how, this, 
how an algorithm for an accelerator is implemented. You don't have the loop anymore here, as you can see in this code, but instead, sorry, but instead you have just one function, and in the function call there's a special um, nomenclature, the triple chevron for the CUDA backend, where you say, I want to run this function eight by eight times, and the function itself, no, itself finds out somehow where it has to work on by using these uh, predefined values. So this, these values will be, eat, will be different, of course, for each instance of the scale um, function. And you can literally, literally scale the whole vector at the same time. So let's look at an abstract model of such an accelerator. It's a coprocessor, which means um, you have to have some other processor that issues commands to this thing um, that runs an operating system, drivers, whatever. The accelerator itself is kind of a hierarchical configuration of trimmed down cores, so to speak. They call them, the vendors call them cores, but I think they are not more than arithmetic logic units. Um, and this hierarchy can be uh, split up into the lowest level, which is threads, where you have the arithmetic logic unit. Then you have warps, which basically are a group of arithmetic logic units that share one instructions. It's very similar to SIMD. Um, then you have the blocks, where you can um, have local synchronization, so you can have sh uh, synchronize multiple warps. You have also a programmable cache on the block level, which is very use useful. And then there's the grid or the kernel level that, that describes the whole problem domain for one kernel and that can also uh, do global synchronization. Another important point that many accelerators have uh, is a large number of registers that allows you to run many concurrent contexts. Um, that means if, say, one warp needs memory, uh, needs to access memory, but the memory latency doesn't allow uh, the access right away, um, the accelerator can schedule another warp and leave the context of the waiting warp active but waiting and schedule another warp. This, this is a good way to uh, hide memory latency. Then most, or let's say, yeah, most uh, accelerators have dedicated memory uh, with very high memory bandwidth. This is also a very big difference uh, from the CPUs that have um, an order of magnitude lower memory bandwidth than uh, most accelerators. And they, if they have a dedicated memory, they also have a programmable DMA engine um, and concurrent there's concurrent command dispatch. So if one kernel or one function doesn't use all the resources of the accelerator, some accelerators support the fact that you can um, schedule another command that uses the rest of the resources of the accelerator concurrently. So there are many, many accelerators out there today. Many vendors build these things. Um, the big three, I guess, are NVIDIA, AMD, and Intel. But um, I want you to remember that almost every smartphone that we have today has one of these accelerators bundled with the CPU. And we can program these accelerators in the very same way that we program the big accelerators from NVIDIA, AMD, and Intel. And one uh, accelerator type that sort of is very different from all the others, and I won't cover them, but I want to mention them here, is FPGAs. Um, they are interesting. They are getting more and more interesting because we can now, we can now start to program these accelerators in a way, in the same way as we program uh, GPU accelerators, which was not possible before. For, before you had to write, write some, uh, program them in, in some hardware description languages, which is very cumbersome. Yes? Uh, could you just give me an idea of the number of cores, or I guess cores is not the right word, ALU units is the word you use. Yes. Or, uh, that these, that these uh, little gizmos have? I mean, are we talking... How many can be in we're talking operation eight? at parallel? What, what power, yeah. Uh, we're talking 100,000, we're talking 10. I have, uh, I'm very intrigued with it. I have no concept of, of, of the scale we're talking about. So the question is how many cores are we talking here? How many uh, cores are, uh, or arithmetic logic units are included in these GPUs? Well, it really depends. They scale from a few to a few thousand, you could say. Not 100,000, not 10,000, but a few thousand. 
So, like, if you just wanted to say in the order of a thousand, you'd, you'd be in the ballpark for, for the majority. For example, the one, the one in my phone, that I, it's un, it would be unbelievable to me that that would have it. No, a few, more like a hundred. Even that's pretty unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, f um, especially for games or for, for these GPUs that we use in common uh, off-the-shelf systems, they scale quite well. Or the vendors provide or, or offer systems that have only a few cores, tens of dozens of cores, and then the top of the line systems have usually a few thousand. All right. What are the tools we can use today to program these um, accelerators? There are automated tools um, like OpenMP and OpenACC that allow us to put pragmas in our so existing source code and then the compiler will take the loop that was annotated with the pragma and try to put it on an accelerator. Um, this is a very high level tool that um, works for some use cases very well. And then there are libraries, or I, as I'd like to call them, I think it's an old term that is not used anymore, active libraries. For me, the difference between a library and an active library is if you take a FFT library, it does one thing, it has one algorithm implemented, you cannot modify it and change it, and an active library helps you to build your own algorithms. Um, and then, of course, there's the lower level, uh, which is the do-it-yourself level, where you have the vendor supplied, um, or the, um, well, not, not, not always from the vendor, but CUDA is from NVIDIA, and there's uh, the more open version, OpenCL, where you can really touch this de these devices, program the DNA engines, and express your computation in a very low level, so to say. Yes? Uh, there was another talk that talked about C++ AMP from Microsoft. Yes. How does that fit in this scheme? Um, somewhere between active library and do it yourself. I will talk about C++ AMP um, okay, in, in more detail. OK. Um, in preparation for this talk, I reviewed a number of libraries. These are the libraries I could find today where there was source code available um, that are uh, uh, compatible or that, that can be used in C++ and can and allow us to do um, accelerator computation. There's Thrust from NVIDIA, maybe the most famous and the biggest and maybe one of the first libraries. Um, there's the answer from AMD, which is Bolt. Um, there's VexCL, it's a very nice library. We have Boost Compute, and actually the author of Boost Compute is in the audience. Then there's C++ AMP, we already had a talk about this. There's a, an answer, I think it's kind of an answer to C++ AMP um, from the Kronos group, which, which is Sickle. I don't really know much about it yet because not a lot of information is available. Um, there's Vienna CL, a library for very high-level numeric analysis uh, work on accelerators, and there are now a couple of other, uh, others. This one is a commercial library, um, and in the end, I put my, my very own library that I will talk about very briefly, briefly later. Yes, there was a question. Yes, uh, open, so Sickle is from the Kronos guys who also do open CL? Well, the question was, is, does Kronos know that? Does Sickle also open CL? I think it's uh, a layer above open CL. Okay. Kind of. Or let's say it's the C++ way to do open CL. As I said, I'm not really sure what this thing is. But we will, there will be more information available, I think, in the coming weeks and months. All right. So, what problems do these libraries solve? What do we do, have to do to program these libraries? I think there are two um, categories of problems. One is coordination, and one is computation. Coordination uh, includes everything we have to do regarding the concurrency that these systems exhibit, and the memory management. Many of these systems have, have distributed memory, and we have to somehow manage this um, systems. How can we do computation on them? There's parallel primitives that, STD, uh, that the STL, for example, provides. We can, of course, have algorithms like this also for accelerators. And then there are custom accelerator functions um, that we want to write, write. 
um, there's numerical ana analysis um, we can do very efficiently on these systems. So we maybe want to have some high level abstraction for numerical analysis. What we have to think about um, when writing or when implementing something on the accelerator is how is the performance portable um, across different hardware architectures and even maybe versions of uh, the same architecture. And then there's um, something I would like to talk about in the end of this talk, which is kernel space exploration. I will go about, uh, I will talk about this in more detail in the end. So let's talk about concurrency. Concurrency um, is a very interesting thing when talking about accelerators because we can overlap accelerator functions and transfers and data transfers or multiple accelerator functions. So we what we want to have is asynchronous memory transfers, asynchronous accelerator function invocation, and at some point, of course, we have to synchronize these things, so we need some means of synchronizing them. The way I, I always I like to think about these uh, concurrency problems is in terms of a dependency graph. What, we, what this could be is um, we could have here a memory transfer to the accelerator, then there's some computation, and then there's memory transfer back to the host system. A more complex and more efficient graph, if we have to run this kernel, um, if you have to do the, the computation multiple times on, di on different data, we could have the same thing, transfer to the system, to the accelerator, compute, transfer back, and while we do the first compute, we could already transfer in a kind of a double buffering scheme the second um, data that we need for the, for the second computation. And while we do the second computation, we could, if we have two DMA engines, we could copy memory for this computation and copy memory from this computation back. You get the idea. So we need some way of describing this uh, concurrency dependency graph. And the way that this is usually done is by some kind of a queue or a feed or a stream. Um, OpenCL calls this a command queue, CUDA calls it a stream, I like to call it a feed, where we enqueue commands to it and at some point say, okay, for this command to, f to, to, to finish, or before you start this command, wait for the other command in the other queue to, to synchronize these things. So these are objects indicating independent operations. While here at the conference I talked about this uh, with a few people and um, they suggested that this could be uh, represented or described in terms of futures and promises. I've not fully um, understood this, but I think it might be possible to have some kind of concurrency approach based on futures for accelerators. The, so much from um, concurrency. Let's talk about memory management. We can have, uh, in my opinion, two different ways of mem managing memory. There's implicit mem memory management, where we say, here's my STD vector. Please uh, sort it on the GPU very fast in parallel. And then the runtime system has to basically copy the mem or first ex uh, allocate memory on the GPU, copy it over, do the computation, copy it back, and you have your result. Very elegant and very nice way of doing it but of course not very efficient. So to be very efficient, we have to think about explicit memory management. And for this, we need, of course, containers to present mem to, that represent memory on the accelerator, and we need functions that transfer the memory. Um, here's a, a code example, a very simple code example of how this could look like, what this could look like. We say we want to interact with device zero in the system. Um, we allocate an device array of type float with a size on the device D. We have a vector and then we do, we call copy to move the data over. Just as a yes. Uh, um, it could be possible to create an allocator that actually does the device memory allocations for you under the hood and then make a vector that is a vector of floats but has the device array as its allocator type. So the question was, could the STD vector have an allocator that, not, that allocates memory on the accelerator? I think that could be possible. I'm not sure what is, it means then to access a value, because you have to do... Yeah, uh, you will have huge problems because whenever you want to, to use a very close uh, access to it, you have to go back and forth to choose memory. Um, I would... 
So the, the comment, okay, the uh, comment I is. I don't think resize nor copy will work to the world. So the comment is that you will get problems if you try to do this. <laughs> and I will talk about this in the next, on the next slide. Um, since, we, since I talked about concurrency, maybe it would make sense to have a copy async. And of course, many libraries, in particular Boost Compute has this copy async library, where you basically say, I want this copy operation to, be, to run on a feed or a queue or a stream or whatever have you. And um, this copy operation should probably return a future that you can at some point wait for. So you have synchronous and asynchronous um, memory uh, copy operations. One problem I see with this approach is if, we have an, if you have code like this that runs fine on accelerator X, and then you have another accelerator that shares the main memory with the host system, you actually don't need to copy. It's a zero copy. You just say, OK, here's the memory. Use this now for the computation on the accelerator, because they share the memory. I don't know what this code um, should do then in that case if there's a, if there's a zero copy because, um, yeah, I'm just not sure if this code would work in that case. So what I would like for, for such a kind of interface to have is um, not only a single dimension vector but also a multi-dimensional vector. There's a very nice proposal for this. N3851 that I would really like to see in the standard. Um, we can, of course, if we have in a system multiple accelerators, it might be possible to spread a vector across multiple accelerators. We could think, could think about that. And in fact, some libraries do that. Um, for example, VexCL does that. So the copy interface, what could it look like? It could be the assignment operator, which is maybe not so nice because it would be diff difficult to adjust new types that we don't know about. It could be iterator-based, it could be range-based, or we could think about something else. One interesting question is, uh, can we support or should we support copy from non-contiguous memory? This will be less efficient and we have to do more here because maybe we have to, if we want to copy a list to the accelerator, we need to copy each each element of the list to a staging area and then do a bulk copy, things like this. But it could be valuable to have something like this. And then, of course, if you think about numeric analysis, it would make sense to have um, functions to fill containers, like a, to have a constant or fill it with an identity. And coming back to the question that was there about the accelerate, uh, about the, the allocator for STD vector. Um, if we have a convenient memory interface like this, where we can say, I have a device array, but I still can access it from the host. I can still put data there. And I can still read, I, I can also read from it. What's, what, how could we implement this? We have to read and write every time, maybe. We have to, or we could track modifications and do bulk reads and writes. Um, one li library I reviewed, um, which I found very interesting, is they replaced the array subscript operator here with the function call operator to indicate to the user that this operation is very costly. So if you access this, uh, this uh, object on the host, you have to do a function call operator. And on the device, you do the uh, array subscript operator. Um, I found this idea interesting to convey to the user, OK, this is really costly. You shouldn't do that. Um, of course, if we, we could do some kind of lazy copy. Um, and one idea I like is the accessor idea, where we have this, this um, device array. And then we say, OK, please, device array, give me a type that allows me, give me an object that allows me to access this uh, block of memory from the host. Maybe it can be a scoped uh, accessor that goes out of, if it goes out of scope, it copies the data back. And we could also state our intentions with the regards to how we want to access this memory. Um, we could say, I want to only read from this so you don't need to copy the data back, or we I only want to write to this so we don't need the original data or modify. So these are the things um, that we could, could think about. We could also have some something like a reversed um, memory management, which is something that is done in C++ AMP, 
we have the vector and the host, and we create an array view that basically allows us to access the data um, that is lives on the host on the accelerator. When the copy is done here, um, it's a little bit um, unclear. Of course, as soon as we access this array view on the host uh, on the accelerator, the data has to be there. So as soon as an, a kernel accesses it, as accesses it, the data has to be copied there. Yes, a question. Just in, in general, in terms of performance between the, the model where the memory is shared between the CPU and GPU and where the memory is distinct and you have to actively copy, what are the performance trade-offs in those two models? So the question is, what is the performance trade-off between having a dedicated memory on the GPU or sharing the memory with the host? Is that correct? So um, memory access um, is a lot faster if you have dedicated memory. On the, if the memory is already on the device, you have an order of magnitude higher bandwidth. But of course, to copy the data over, you have to go through the PCI Express bus, which is, I don't know, um, eight, eight gigabytes per second, something like this, depending on which generation you're using. Um, and on, if, if it's shared memory, the memory access, uh, the memory bandwidth is similar to the CPU memory bandwidth. Yes, another Did question. Did do any sort of automatic caching? So if data is used by one kernel, um, let's say the Mark data guy, but there's each of the ALUs has their own dedicated memory, this is the off device, off, off device memory. Is there a caching scheme that is automatically employed by some of these GPUs? There is a cache for that can be used within one kernel call. So if you access within one kernel um, elements multiple times, you will use a cache. But other than that, across multiple kernel calls, I'm not aware of any caching. OK? So uh, we talked about um, how to work with these systems, but we didn't talk about yet how to describe our computation. Um, the limitations that, that there are currently uh, for OpenCL is that the accelerator functions must be passed as a string and are compiled at runtime. And these, in this string, you can only have C99 syntax, so you don't have C++ support, no templates. Um, for CUDA, the limitations are a little bit less, but you have all the functions you want to run on an accelerator have to be dec dec uh, decorated with underscore, underscore, device, underscore, underscore, which can be some, somewhat cumbersome. And you, CUDA only supports uh, NVIDIA hardware. For C++, I'm not sure what the limitations are, um, so I put question marks there. As I said before, the easiest way to use an accelerator is a parallel primitive. These are also called, um, sometimes in some libraries, called skeletons or higher order functions. There's a technical specification for C++ extensions for parallelism that kind of uh, covers this, but I'm not very satisfied with, this, with the way that it's described, or I don't understand it yet, I'm not sure. The way they uh, want to do it is have some parallel uh, version of an algorithm that can be, or the algorithm itself can be tagged somehow, and then some runtime system somehow figures out how to run this thing in parallel. I'm not sure I agree with this. Um, what, make, what would make more sense, in my opinion, is to have this uh, object be something more powerful, like a scheduler, or something that has a feed inside. So um, I think this would, would be much more useful. But I don't know what, what they are planning to do with it. Um, when implementing parallel primitives, of course, you want these algorithms to, ha to run on the host and the accelerator. You want um, a lambda or function objects to specify custom operators. And here's an example from the Boost Compute Library um, that, allows, uh, that allows you to um, do that, to do exactly that. Um, there's a macro, since I said before that this is based on OpenCL, and you have to pass 
the kernels you want to run as a string. Um, Boost Compute uses a macro um, that generates this add4 function or functor that can be then put into uh, the transform um, uh, algorithm or higher order function. This is quite nice. I really like this kind of uh, way of extending parallel primitives. Another way of extending parallel primitives, which I first saw in Thrust from NVIDIA, is to have fancy iterators. Um, if your algorithm doesn't support your type or you want to extend it somehow, you can have some kind of different, you can have different iterators that allow you to extend these algorithms that you can put then in, in here. But what about writing accelerator functions? We, par I mean, parallel primitives go only so far. You will sometimes, or quite often, depending on your use case, you will want to write your own functions. Today, you can do this in the backend DIY style in CUDA or OpenCL syntax. You can, of course, um, as I shown before, put lambda expressions as arguments to parallel primitives. But this is also maybe not covering all of your use cases. So, the nicest way I've seen. Uh, up until now to write accelerator functions is implemented in C++ AMP. Um, it allows you to write the, ex the function as a lambda that is passed to the parallel for each. Um, the number of threads that, are, that should be run are passed here in this extent uh, argument. Um, this is basically the similar uh, example I've shown before where some vector is scaled by a scalar. There's another library, HSL, that does something similar through um, macro-based instructions and expression templates. You can, in their, in their library, write code like this, which I find really interesting that they go through all this uh, just to make this possible. You see that you have if underscore for underscore, you have int with a big I, Stuff like this allows you, and then um, the function is called through a, with an evil uh, function. This is also another way of implementing this. Um, not so nice, but yes, question. Yeah, so if I understand the way that C++ AMP works, is the compiler generates the kernels, when it, and, and with the other one it does. Uh, do the kernels get compiled at? Um, do the kernels get generated at compile time, or do they get generated at uh, when the program is executed? The question was, are the kernels generated when the pro at compile time or when the program is executing? That's a good question, and that really depends on the back end. Um, for NVIDIA, the kernels are, for the NVIDIA back end, for uh, CUDA, they are generated and compiled at compile time, but for OpenCL, they are generated, depending on the library, they are either generated at co compile time or runtime, but they are compiled at runtime. They are passed as a string to the, run to the uh, OpenCL library, and then you get something back that is, looks like a, um, that you can uh, use to call the, uh, the kernel. And then there's also, of course, expression templates, which is very extensively used in the VEXCL library, another library I like very much. Um, here you, um, it, the, the VEXCL library gives you a number, number of primitives and overloads uh, m many operators. And you can just write an expression like this, and it will generate the kernel and run it. Um, I think this is uh, really very beautiful. But of course, somewhat limited. Of course, you can specify your own. Um, your own functions here. Um, yeah, this is, it's, a, it's a higher level abstraction um, that is very nice and very useful, especially if you do numeric analysis, analysis or any other higher level uh, scientific codes. Um, VexCL also allows you to generate kernels with Boost Proto from existing code. If you're interested in that, I uh, suggest you, you look at that. It's very, very cool. It's somewhat limited, but still, still somewhat useful. It's, but it's really cool. And then there's finally numeric analysis. Numerical analysis. Um, the best library for this I could find is Vienna CL, where you have just an, 
incredible number of useful um, algorithms to use on the GPU. And now, very briefly, my own library in just one slide. Um, it's very low level. My goal with this library was to um, combine the OpenCL and the NVIDIA backend in one somewhat concise and not too ugly looking interface. So what you can do with, and this library only covers so far the coordination part. Computation, you still have to do your, uh, you have to still write your algorithms or your kernels in the DIY backend style, so either OpenCL or CUDA. But you uh, can say, I want to interact with the device zero. Um, I want to issue commands to the device through a feed. Um, I want to have some memory with these dimensions. These are, this is the, um, the bounds extension that is proposed for the standard library um, that I really like. I copy the data um, over from the host to the device. And then I, I invoke a kernel that I compiled here through create module from file. And then I extracted one kernel from this module. And I call the kernel here. Um, specify how many threads I want. I specify um, in, the, in the hierarchy how, many, how, how the hierarchy should be uh, segmented. I pass arguments. And I want, I'd say I want to run it in this feed. And I copy the result back. And since everything here is asynchronous, um, I have to say I want to wait for the feed to finish all its operations. And then I have the result in the vector. Yes, a question. Sorry? Um, the question was, is invoke a synchronization point? Invoke is not a synchronization point. Invoke is also asynchronous. Everything is asynchronous. So how do you make sure that public finish the um, Since I, uh, I issued the command to the same feed, um, and the feed doesn't reorder operations, um, I can be sure that the copy is finished once I invoke this. In the same right. If I created another feed here and launched this kernel in another feed, I wouldn't be sure. I shouldn't do that. No, it particularly allows, and the question was, does this not prevent me from doing pipelining? No, this particularly allows me to do pipelining because I just can have another feed that I use for the, cop uh, for the copy while I do the, the computation. Okay. And I, I wrote some very simple macros to write and kernel in a way that um, compiles both for CUDA and OpenCL. It's very simple. Um, here's the kernel that would scale uh, some vector by a value. And I did some benchmarks. Because, yay, benchmarks. I run this kernel on the GeForce Titan. And since this kernel does not a lot of computation, um, the performance of the kernel is determined by the, memory, the, the bandwidth. How fast is the memory accessed? And I plot here the bandwidth I measured uh, divided by the peak bandwidth of the device. And for the Titan, I get between 70 and 80% of peak bandwidth. For the Phi, I get not a lot. Then I changed this algorithm a little bit. I changed the memory access pattern. And I got something different. The Phi now performs a little better in terms of memory excess bandwidth, the Titan a little bit slower. I don't want to say anything about my code here, about Titan, or about the Phi. I want to say that we can write kernels in many, many different ways. They still give us the same results, the numerical results, but the performance will be very different. And with this benchmark, I want to motivate my last point, which is kernel space exploration. The way, there are many ways to implementing this, any kernel. Since it's a hierarchical architecture, we can map many things to different things. We can access memory in a different way. We can make use of the cache that we can program and things like that. So I would like to see 
some thing, some library that allows us to experiment with this kind of uh, experiment in this kernel space. And one library that does that, it's unfortunately um, in Haskell, is Obsidian. Um, to quote from their latest paper, they say they raise, they want to raise the level of, of level of abstraction and still give the programmer control of the details relevant to kernel performance. I really, really like this idea of um, trying out different kernels in a very easy way and finding the best kernel for the current uh, platform. So what they do, I don't fully understand everything they, they, they write about. I like their idea. I have to uh, look more into it. This is the paper if anyone is interested in this. And Obsidian is, of course, um, open source. They make available hardware hierarchy in, an abs in different abstractions. That's their main idea. Another library that does something similar is Halide, a, a library which I also like. It's a, a domain-specific language for image processing. And they have this idea that they split um, the two things. They split what to compute and how to compute. So they say, um, I want to do this operation, x plus y. Um, and here they can they say how to do this operation. Um, they split the two things. I really like this idea very much, and I wonder if this is of, if something like this could not be possible um, for GPUs as well. Um, what they do here is they say they split the two loops over x and y into an inner and an outer loop, and do some uh, reordering there to get a better performance or to tr just to try out a different algorithm. It's not necessarily better performance, but they just can say, can try out um, with a domain specific language different versions of the algorithm and can test them. And to finish up, there's this notion that was recently introduced in a paper which is called copious parallelism, which basically means to get good performance on all platforms, we have to optimize for each platform. And I think with, this, with tools that allow us to explore the kernel space, we can simplify this copious, copious parallelism um, thing significantly. And also what I could imagine is if we have tools to explore the kernel's kernel space, we could also do auto-tuning. That means we let an algorithm try the different versions of the kernel for us for different platforms. And um, I think this, this, could be, this could work and could be great. To conclude, um, I would like to see abstractions that allow kernel level, kernel space explorations. The most elegant way to write, I want an elegant way to write kernels. The most elegant way I've seen is in C++ AMP. Uh, I like to see this for all platforms, not in the way C++ AMP does the other thing like uh, concurrency and memory management, but the way how they express kernels. I really like this and I really like, would like to see that everywhere. And furthermore, I'd like to see a monolithic set of libraries that build upon each other on different levels that help me, the DSP programmer, my colleagues, the application programmers, and the scientific programmers. On different, they work on very different levels. We work on different levels. And, but I would like to see libraries that um, work together to solve our particular problems. And um, if we get bad performance in our application, I would like to fall back to DSP style in, within the same framework and s try to figure out how to get more performance. And what I think is very important is that we consider future hardware in this. Um, the main point will be that future hardware probably doesn't have dedicated memory or, and shares main memory with the CPU. Um, if you want to have a look at Aura, it's on GitHub, and this is my talk. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Um, so one of the great things about GPUs is they do a bunch of stuff in parallel. And if you add sort of synchronization between, like, I'm just thinking if you allowed it to be, to have things walk between them, Easier, like if there are lock semantics and ways of doing synchronization, 
there are some synchronization between kernels, right? Facilities right now in certain GPU engines, right? I think the vendors generally advise not to do, advise you not to do this, but. Yeah, so that's my, my question is, if they, if some library comes out that makes it easier, isn't that bad? Wouldn't that be a bad thing to allow? Because then people would use it and then they would get horrible performance. Maybe it's better not to have that concept in, in that programming space at all, just to prevent people from abusing it. Your thought? Um, I kind of agree, but there are, there are programmers that you just want to give them simple tools and it's good enough for them. They don't get the maximum performance but it's good enough for them to have, um, I don't know, five times better performance than MATLAB. They will be happy. They will work more efficiently. They will, won't have to run their algorithms overnight. Things like that. So I think there's still a value in libraries that are not at the mac maximum performance, but um, still allow you to, to have better performance than without them. Okay.